Yes, I'm entitled these talks The Universe from the Isle of Man because I'm not just talking about astronomy. I'm going to be talking about some elements of space flight as well because space flight and astronomy are linked in, in very much interwoven together. In fact, telescopic astronomy is now a major part of the subject. And that will be the subject of my next uh, session, which will be next week on the Hubble Space Telescope. But basically, what we want to do now is just talk about what's visible. These, now, why is that not working? There we go. That's wonderful. We're not working. Sorry, I'm not, my slides aren't advancing when they should do. There we go. Ignore the pointer. It works like that, but it won't work. Never mind. Okay. Um, so basically, what we're going to be talking about is tonight we're going to talk about the Manx, sorry, not tonight, old habits die hard. This morning we're going to talk about the Manx May night sky. Next week we're going to talk about Mr. Hubble and his amazing telescope. Uh, the following week we're going to talk about constellations. Then we're going to talk about Mars, which is going to be very, very topical in the next few months because there's four different spacecraft being launched to Mars um, this summer, uh, getting to Mars next spring. So that will be very exciting. Um, then we're going to talk about the June Manx night sky, uh, which is always a time when we have the TT and the amount of people who are TT fans who come over and come to our observatory, the Alaman Astronomical Society Observatory. It's amazing the interest, the technical interest in bikes and also in the space and the heavens is quite an um, amazing link, which I didn't know about uh, until it happened. Um, on the 8th of June, we're going to talk about the moon. We were going to talk about the moon next week, but I'm going to leave it till the month after um, so we can do Hubble next week. Then we're going to talk about we are made of stardust, this wonderful concept that the substances, the elements within our bodies was actually forged in the centres of stars. Then we're going to talk about meteors and shooting stars. We had a meteor shower a few days ago, so I thought I'll leave that now till we get near to the next decent meteor shower, which isn't actually till the end of um, August. And then we're going to finish off with our final session um, until we look at how far we're going and beyond this uh, we'll look at the Manx sky in the month of July. So that's the plan. As I say we'll take questions at the end um, but the first thing I've got to mention is of course the planet Venus and Venus is absolutely dominating our skies at the moment. You can't miss it. If anybody has not seen Venus then I don't know where you've been on the planet. We've had wonderful weather recently and Venus is shining like a beacon in the western sky and if you wonder which way is west then just look towards Peel unless of course you're in Peel in which case look towards Ireland. Uh, but Venus really is fantastic to see and Venus is actually going to be at its brightest tomorrow. Now you might think, how can it be brighter tomorrow? Um, you know, how do we know that sort of thing? And it's, it's one of those little technical things we can talk about is this is Venus. Now what happens is the sun is down here, the sun is down here. And what is happening is Venus, when it's the far side of the sun, it's a full phase. And as it gets higher and higher in the sky, it changes to a half phase. And then eventually, just before it goes inside the orbit of the earth and the sun, it goes to a crescent phase. Now Venus, at the moment is around about this position. So when you've got the maximum size and the most illumination, Venus is at its brightest. And it's actually going to be 27% illuminated on the 28th of April, which is of course tomorrow. Then very rapidly, it's going to drop down between the earth and the sun and will become a very thin crescent and will disappear completely, completely from our skies. It will first of all disappear into a very light sky with the sun going down and Venus will um, not be as easy to spot. And then it goes between the Earth and the sun on the 3rd of June. But on the 22nd of May, in about three weeks time, uh, Venus roughly in this position again down here, but it'll now be a thinner crescent, is going to be very close to the planet Mercury. And being close to Mercury, um, that's the chance to see Mercury in our night skies, which is something you won't see very often. And we'll talk about that as we go through the sessions in the course of the next few weeks. But Venus, when it's at its stage of tomorrow, that's what Venus would look like if we could get a big telescope on it or even a, a spacecraft near it uh, observing from the Earth. It's not quite a half. It's between a half and uh, a crescent. As I say, it's about 28% illuminated, and that's why Venus is at its brightest, not when it's furthest from the, the sun, when it's in a night sky or a longer period in the night sky, but when it's between a half and a crescent phase. So something to look out for tomorrow. Now, the weather forecast for the next couple of days is good for today and tomorrow. After that, I'm afraid it's going downhill. So please get outside tonight, have a look at Venus and see for yourselves 
and just see that brilliant dominance that Venus has got. And here's a little interesting experiment you can try. They reckon Venus is bright enough to cast a shadow. So if you stand with Venus in front of you with a white wall behind you, see if you can see the Venusian shadow. There's an interesting thing. We've done this at the observatory and it does work. It's only very, very faint, but you can make out a Venusian shadow. So that's something novel to look for. But that's Venus. The other thing I can tell you about is, I've mentioned Mercury already, which will be visible in the morning sky on roughly the 22nd to about the 25th of May. And we'll talk about that near the time. But if you get up early in the morning, this is 4.30 in the morning, looking due east just before sunrise. And you can see the brilliant planet Jupiter, which is very bright indeed. Jupiter's there, Saturn is much fainter there, and Mars is here. And Mars is actually going to be very, very bright and very, very dominant in our skies over the course of the next few months as it heads to what we call opposition, which will be in October. And obviously, um, we'll be talking about that when I do my Mars talk, uh, because Mars will be really very, very bright. Jupiter is always very bright. Venus is always very bright when you can see it, when it's uh, obviously each side of the sun. But Mars changes from being bright to being faint. And this October, it will be very bright indeed. It will be rivaling Jupiter for brightness and indeed Venus, but it really is worth looking for. And so many exciting things going on with uh, Mars. As I say, we'll be talking that as we go through the lectures and the sessions in the next few weeks. Moving on, um, a lot of you I'm sure heard on Manx Radio about the, Leon, the not the Leonid, sorry, the Lyrid meteor shower. And I've got to say, I was disappointed. I got up, well, I didn't get up, I stayed up and I, waited to see the Lyrid meteor shower last weekend and I didn't see a single one. I did see a couple of what we call sporadic meteors um, which are ones that are not related to the shower and although it wasn't spectacular from the Isle of Man it was well seen from the United States. This photograph here by a lady called Tina, uh, I can't see her surname, the, the screen's blocked it off, um, but they saw the shower at two o'clock in the morning American time, which would have been the peak, would have been seven o'clock in the morning for us. So that's probably why we didn't get to see very many. Some of the other members of the Astronomical Society, I managed to see a couple of them, but I, as I say, I didn't see a single one. But um, moving on, moving on, I want to tell you about the Starlink satellites now, and this was the scene at Cape Kennedy last Wednesday. Four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. Now the most successful rocket in history. Most often, the lines have been more successful than any of the rocket. But the best is yet to come. I'm sure you'll be excited to know we're going to land this rocket on a barge in the middle of the ocean. Stage separation confirmed. Successful, Nico. Successful stage step. And it appears we have reignited or ignited that second stage engine for SES 1. Flag deploy. Look at the heat in the engine. The there. there it is. And there it comes, landing, the first stage uh, rocket landing see. on the barge in the we have cheers. the Atlantic Ocean. We have a rocket. <laughs> awesome. This is the fourth landing for this booster. And that, of course, was the SpaceX launch, um, the Starlink, um, the, the sixth Starlink mission. Now, these Starlink satellites are satellites that are communication satellites, basically in low Earth orbit, which are going to provide internet access throughout the world. Now, I've got mixed feelings about them. They look spectacular because um, you get these chains of satellites going across the sky, but they are very distracting as astronomers, but they're worth seeing. And my next little video I've got for you now with a bit of luck, if it works, I don't know how bright this is going to be. That should be playing now. And I don't think it is. No, it's not. Hang on, we'll just go back again. I'll just try that one more time, but I don't think it's going to work for me. There should be music as well. And if I can hear the music, the video is playing. If the music's not playing, the music's not. Hang on. No. I'll try one more time. No. Basically, what I was trying to show you, if you look at that picture now, you can see quite clearly there are some stars. Well, what happens is that this star here, and oh, I'll just try that, it might work now. I think it's going to work now. No. Um, these are the stars of the constellation of Taurus. There's a very distinct V-shape of stars there. 
and this is a star, but the Starlink satellites just slowly track across the sky in a chain. They're literally a chain of satellites and they're fascinating to look at and they can be predicted. And my next slide actually gives you the times tonight when we can see it. If you just look here, and this is just an extract of what we can see. If you just look down here at this middle column here. These are the times when these satellites will be at their highest point oh, um, in the sky from the Isle of Man. This is the height above the horizon. This is the time. Just look at the times, 22, 34, 36, 40, 45, 49, 53. About every three or four minutes, you're getting to see one of these satellites coming across the sky. Last week, and um, this you might notice at the top there, it says Starlink 5. This is the, the launch that took place in March this year. And um, Starlink 6, which was visible, it's not visible tonight. And um, because they'd just been launched, they were lower down and they literally were a chain, bang, 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 one after the other. Now they're going slightly higher up, they're spread out more, not quite as spectacular, but well worth looking out for. So just make a note, I don't know if you're recording this or what, but if you make a note about half past 10, just after half past 10 tonight, look up and the altitude you need to be looking at is around 50 odd degrees, 55, 45 degrees for the first view, which is halfway up, that's 90, that's zero. So halfway up is 45 and the di compass direction is south, southwest. So looking towards um, uh, Ireland, looking towards the south of the island, towards Ireland, the Irish coast. And it, basically, all these satellites travel from west to east. So if you ever see something in the sky moving from west to east, it'll be a satellite. If it's going the other way, then it's probably a shooting star or a meteor. Moving on, I just must finish with just a picture of this to whet your appetite. This is our subject next week. And the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, as I say, 30 years ago. And it really has been the most spectacular instrument and told us so much about space. There was a great documentary on the BBC uh, on Friday night and it's available on iPlayer if you want to watch it. Really, it's one of the best space videos I've seen for some time. But I'm conscious of the time, so we need to move on. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about now in the night sky. The constellations and the th things we can see in the night sky for the month of May. And these are what we call the spring constellations. Because if we look at the spring constellations, obviously they're the ones we see at around 10 o'clock at night. I've done this for roughly 10 o'clock at night. But if we look towards the western horizon, we will see. So that's the whole sky for a minute, sorry. And what I just wanted to show was there are 25 stars ranked by brightness. And we can see a total of 15 of them from the Isle of Man. And of that 15, 13 of them are visible tonight, if it's clear. And that's the names of them down on the side there. Now, if we just look at the western sky here now, the constellations of winter are now setting in the western sky. Now, of these bright stars in our sky, most of them appear to be in the, the sky in the winter. We have Capella there, the sixth brightest. We have Aldebaran, the 14th brightest, and so on. Rigel and Betelgeuse and Procyon and Pollux and Castor. And I'm changing them to red there just so you can see. And on the right-hand side, if you can see it, is the distance those stars are away from us in light years. And we'll talk about light years in a future session. So stars are all different distances away from us, but some are more powerful than others. And as a result, they shine very, very bright indeed. But let's just move on now to the southern horizon. Oh, I mentioned Sirius there, the brightest star is just visible on our horizon. But if we look towards the south southern horizon now, this is the same picture we had a second ago, but we'll zoom in on the south. And you can see the constellation Leo the Lion, very, very bright, very, very easy to see with a bright star called Regulus at the bottom of what we call the reversed question mark. If you can imagine a question mark, but it's the wrong way around, and this reversed question mark denotes the head of the lion. And if we look at Leo as a lion, that's the lion, it's one of the few constellations that looks a little bit like what it's meant to represent. And that's the Leo the Lion. I'm a Leo, incidentally. Uh, I don't do astrology. That's a load of old rubbish. And if you want to talk about astrology, um, I'll, I'll mute your microphone. But the signs of the zodiac are the signs that the sun passes through at the time you're born. Or so they will tell us. It actually doesn't work out. It's, it's actually wrong. But that's why you have birth signs, which is the only time I'll ever talk about anything to do with the subject of astrology, which I'll be shouted at now by our society members for even mentioning the subject. But Leo goes through, um, sorry, the sun goes through Leo in mid-August and mid-September, and this reversed question mark is very, very distinctive. And 
if you like, your homework is to find Leo between now and next week if you're going to join us next week, and I do hope you will. But Leo has got this bright star called Regulus, the royal star, the lion, the king of the jungle. It has the, the king star, Regulus, um, and it can actually be covered up by the moon. And on May the 1st, literally this next weekend, um, the moon is going to be very, very close indeed to Regulus. It won't cover it. It won't occult it, which is the name we give to that. Um, but it won't happen this uh, month, but it does happen occasionally when this star disappears behind the moon as it passes through on its monthly cycle. Um, the other star of great note is the star R. Leonis, which is a variable star, a star that changes in its brightness. And as a result, it can be seen changing in brightness over about 10 months, and this is quite distinctively purple in colour. And Leo is quite an interesting object to look for. I pressed the wrong button there, sorry. Because we also have the Leonid meteor shower. I mentioned the Lyrids from April. Well, the Leonids is another shower that occurs in the month of November. Moving on, we're now going to go to the left-hand side or east of Leo, and we have the very bright star Arcturus, which is actually the fourth the brightest star in our sky. And Arcturus is a great star to find, and it's very easy to find, and it's got below it another very bright star, the 16th brightest, the star Spica, which I'm going to talk about Spica and the constellations of um, Arcturus, uh, Buertes the Herdsman, and um, Virgo the Virgin um, in my June talk, because obviously they slowly track across the sky. Um, but if you want to find Arcturus for yourself, just find the plough. The plough, on this diagram, it's difficult doing in a flat diagram, but the plough is literally overhead. You might wonder where it's gone, well it's overhead. And if you follow the line of the belt, sorry, not the belt, the, um, the handle of the plough down, you arc to Arcturus. It's an easy way to remember it. And then we follow that on by arcing to Arcturus, and then we speed on to the star Spica. And that's how we get to know the stars. It's just like everything else. And people often say to me, and I'll cover this when we talk about constellations, they say to me, how on earth do you make up these weird and wonderful shapes in the sky? Well, I'll say to you, what's the shape of the country Italy? And you'll all say, it looks like a boot. It's no more a boot than Leo is a line in the sky. It's our minds that give these familiar shapes and familiar ideas of what we can see. Um, to make us recognize them. And we use things like Arc to Arcturus and Speed on to Spiker to give you the chance to work out what we're looking for. Moving on, I just want to turn around now. We've done the stars of the north, the south, sorry, the, the west, the south, and the east. We're now going to look overhead and overhead and at the stars of the north. Now I must stress, as I said earlier, the stars of the Great Bear, the Plow or Ursa Major are not on the side going up the, the side of the sky they are literally right overhead and that gives us the ability to use the stars of the of the plow or ursa major to give it its proper name uh, much more clearly on the horizon we have got the two stars or two of the stars of the summer triangle which i'll be talking about later uh, the stars deneb the 20th brightest star and the star vega the fifth brightest star and they are clearly visible on our horizon now you'll notice on the right hand side there all the stars we've spotted in the sky are in red. There's two left. Altair is the third star of the Summer Triangle and is visible in the, um, in the summer and uh, not quite visible at the moment. If the sky horizon wasn't there, Alt Altair would be down here, literally where the E of Northern is. That's where Altair is at 10 o'clock tonight. So really 14 of the top 15 of the top 25 stars are all visible this time of the year. The remaining one we can't see is Fomalhaut, which is the lone bright star of the autumn, which we won't see until much later on in the year, till September and October time. But I want to just go back to Ursa Major, the plough, uh, which we often give it the name Ursa Major. Um, that again is the sky there. And this is the plough. Everyone or most people recognise the plough, but they'll say to themselves, where's it gone? I can't find it. Look directly overhead. There it is for you. And if you use the stars of the plough, which is part of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear, if you look at those stars, uh, you can use them at the right-hand edge of them, or the left-hand edge when it's overhead, point down to the pole star, the point about which all the stars appear to rotate. And there's Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. And if you look very closely, you can see how the shape of Ursa Major is like a bowl with a handle, and Ursa Minor is a similar shape, but the other way around. Well, this is Little Bear Ursa Minor, 
Big Bear, Ursa Major. And you know, throughout history, throughout astronomical history, many civilizations throughout the world without communication between each other have all recognized the bear as, as a bear, Ursa Major as the bear. Hence the name, Ursa is bear, major, big bear, uh, as opposed to Ursa Minor, little bear. And it really is amazing when you consider that different civilizations have all recognized that same shape as their bear. We can also find, not quite in a straight line, but the distinct W in the sky or an M. And McDonald's, I believe, paid a fortune to have that M placed in the sky as an advert for them. Um, and uh, it's always seen as a W or an M, depending which size of the year. That was a joke, by the way. Of course, one difference between doing this sort of stuff is there's no response. You don't get any laughs or anything, but uh, never mind. That's a minor detail. But what I just want to finish off with now when we, uh, on this particular bit of the talk is when we look at the plough, as I say, the plough is an asterism within the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. We tend to see the plough sitting on the northern horizon in autumn as the nights start to get dark. And everyone is familiar with this idea that the plough is sitting on the northern horizon. But because the sky rotates around this central point, this central point here uh, of the pole star, Ursa Minor, uh, at Polaris, the star and the principal star in the constellation of Ursa Minor, all the stars rotate a bit like this. There we go. So when the plough rotates on its side and stands upright on its tail, we're now in the months of winter. We're three months further on in the year. Then we get to spring, it rotates the, to its overhead, and that's the situation we're in now. The plough is literally straight overhead. So just go outside for yourselves tonight. I hope it's gonna be clear tonight. Look straight up and you'll see the stars of Ursa Major and indeed the asterism of the plough. And follow this line down, those two stars there, and you'll find the pole star. And incidentally, if you measure the height of that star above your horizon, that's the latitude of the Isle of Man. It's 54 degrees high. We'll be talking about that in a later session. But finally, three months later, of course, we move on. The plough is now standing upright with his tail pointing up in the sky as he heads down towards the northern horizon, and we go back to the stars of the northern horizon, and of course, um, it, autumn again. And that's how the stars appear to rotate. So basically what you've had there, you've had a view of the sky for the, the next evening. I hope you get the chance to see that uh, over the next few nights. Um, but in the meantime, lots of people have often seen the stars of Ursa Major as a bear. This is the bear. You can see quite clearly there. This is the whole bear. These are the pointer stars that point. This is the autumn. So these two stars point up to the pole star up here. And then we've got the handle there of the bear. These two, these stars here curve down to the star Arcturus. Arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. But I want to leave you with the, um, the words of a, a famous astronomer. It's well known to us astronomers, chap called Alan Chapman, who has a little thing to say to you now. Come on. Tonight, let's look at the great constellations. There's Orion, and of course, the great bear. But wait, something's happening in the field. This is extraordinary. Popmeister, a great lager, follow the great bear. I don't make these things up. But I would leave you with this one. Here we've got a lovely scene. It's sitting in the Isle of Man. What do the stars in the sky tell you, darling? He says to her. They tell me that someone's nicked our caravan or tent, whichever way you look at it. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. I do hope to see you again next week. As I say, we're going to be talking about the subject of the Mr. Hubble and his amazing telescope.